My name is Jennifer Tegenye. Today is March 1st, 2023, and I'm conducting an interview with Destiny Harris as part of the Chicago Youth Movement's Oral History Project. Um, hi, Destiny. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with me today. May I have permission to record this interview? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. So, Destiny, let's start with you telling me a bit about your childhood, where you were born and raised, and about your family. Yes. So, um, my name is Destiny, she, her, they, them, he, him, any pronouns are acceptable. Um, so I'm from the west side of Chicago, particularly the Austin neighborhood. Um, my family grew up all throughout the west side of Chicago as well. So um, in Austin, West Garfield, Humboldt Park, um, those sorts of neighborhoods, but within the same general area. Um, and I'm actually the oldest of eight. Um, my parents are pretty young. They went to school in the neighborhood too. They went to Or Academy. Um, and yeah, for most of my childhood, I, well, for a good majority of my childhood, I lived on the west side of Chicago, attended school in the west side of Chicago. And even today, like most of my family still lives on the west side. Um, and a lot of them actually still live in Austin um, to this day. So yeah, that's so, how a little bit um, about me. Yeah. Could you tell me a bit more about the experiences that you had in Austin, right? Having lived there for most of your life um, and the kinds of institutions that you were interacting with in that neighborhood throughout your childhood. Yeah, so um, throughout my childhood um, in Austin, it's like pretty obvious that like it's void of resources. So it's like one of the largest neighborhoods within the city of Chicago, but one of the neighborhoods that has like the most amount of scarcity at the same time. So growing up, I would say that like the community was pretty like tight knit, like everybody kind of knew each other. Um, I went to school to a school called Francis Scott Key Elementary, which I'll get more into later because it kind of ties into like how I got into organizing. Um, and uh, all of my siblings that were born at the time also went to that school and so it was like sort of tradition like we all had the same kindergarten teacher and mm -hmm. everything um, and also in Austin there's this uh, community center called the Austin Town Hall that was also like a pretty integral part of the community so there we went I would go there for like I was in Girl Scouts at one point um, we did like acting classes they had like dancing classes they had like a swimming pool so they did like swimming lessons for the kid and it was actually like next door to my school and so like the staff of Austin Town Hall would get a lot of students from my school and so they would literally come to my school after school and like rally up the kids that were part of Austin Town Hall and we would all walk there together um as a sort of thing um so yeah that, I would say that was a pretty integral part of my childhood um being a part of that community center and having all these extracurriculars to do mm -hmm. um and my little sisters, when they got old enough, they became a part of Austin Town Hall too and got into like, they had like gymnastics programs. They had like a lot of stuff, which was like pretty interesting considering like the lack of funding that they had, how much they were able to like give to the community and how integral, integral it was to the community. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I would say most of my childhood was spent at Key School. Um, I remember that like, it wasn't the best academically performing school. Mm -hmm. um, and then like around like my fifth or sixth grade year, we got a new principal um, and we were able to like change the school around pretty much. So it had ended up going from like a level three school to like a level, or, like a level four school or something to like a level two or one school. So mm -hmm. we were really able to turn it around and like, everybody who sort of went to that school also lived in the community. So that was also really cool because it was like, okay, you live up the street from me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it was really like community based. Um, and, but at the end of my fifth, fifth grade, fifth or sixth grade, I'm blanking right now, but the end of my fifth or sixth grade year, um, the school got closed because that was in 2013. Um, when Rahm Emanuel had closed the over 50 schools. Um, and mm -hmm. so I would say like, that was like one of the most pivotal moments of my childhood. 
because of the mm-hmm. fact that like like I said I have I'm the oldest of eight and at the time I had like four or five siblings um and it was like we all went to that school like we all had the same kindergarten teacher named Miss Outlaw like it was sort of like tradition um and being like being told that like your school is gonna get closed down like that's something so unfamiliar like I've like I've never heard of anything like that happening like especially as a child like you don't know that stuff like that happens like sure they closed a school or two but they closed down over 50 within the city and the, and all of them be like within black and brown neighborhoods it was kind of crazy especially given like in 2013 I was only 12 mm-hmm. so I was still like not really like conscious of like what's going on in the world and like like yeah. like I can say now that like Austin is a community that's like void of resources but like then it felt like it was an abundance of resources and even still I feel like you get that feeling from being a part of the community today but mm-hmm. I didn't understand like the systemic implications of it until like a little bit later mm-hmm. um so yeah my school ended up getting closed down and like more than half of the teachers were pretty much laid off that were teaching at that school. And it was weird because it's like, as a fifth grader, you know, you have your little friends or a sixth grader. Uh, fifth and sixth grade is when like, you were allowed to like start participating in sports, like middle school sports. So like you started making more friends. Like I was on the volleyball team, I ran track and all these different types of stuff. And then it was like, we all got sort of separated and I didn't see half those people ever again, more than half those people again. Um, like some of my best friends I didn't know where they are to this day Mm -hmm. so that was tough Um, and I also remember that when we were told that like our school was going to get closed down um, they told us that like each school would sort of have like community hearings like Mm -hmm. to hear from like the community members about the school or like the teachers or the students to Mm -hmm. sort of like I guess have a forum about the school. I don't know, it was ridiculous. But I vividly remember like going to some of them and like speaking on behalf of my school and being like, no, like my school shouldn't be closed. Like these teachers need their jobs. Like, and Chicago being like so segregated as it is, like in community, based on like community, like also just closing down so many schools like poses a danger threat to like students like who now have to like travel outside of their neighborhood or like across gang lines like to go to new schools and so I remember going to some of those hearings and I think I went to like two or three of them and spoke um mm-hmm. and at the end of the year they still decided eventually like to close down the school yeah um, and so luckily there was another school just like right down the street from where my elementary school was so the students and the teachers that, you know, didn't go somewhere else or that weren't laid off, they kind of, we kind of all went to the same school. It was like literally on the same street, maybe just like two blocks down. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was really weird because I think originally like the school had a capacity, like had like 200 students and then it went to like 800 or five, 600, 700, something like that. So it was like a lot more students and the school could still like, Fit the students but yeah. the students to teacher ratio wasn't right like there was space physical space in the school for the students but the school teacher ratio wasn't mm-hmm. necessarily the best um and it was also weird because so there's like three there were like three elementary schools within the Austin neighborhood and they're all like within two blocks of each other and so two of them got closed down so not only were it was it students from my school coming there it was students from the other school that had got closed down coming yeah. there too and so we were all sort of like blending um so it went from being like three middle schools like within a certain vicinity of the community to one um so that was an interesting transition because then I had like my other younger sisters my other younger sisters who didn't go to key school and it's like they're getting their fresh start at this new school and so um I would say that was really an integral part of my childhood because I like like I said I didn't have like the language to like recognize like what was going on but like I knew something was off and I sort of really didn't do nothing with it like at the moment and then a few years later I was like okay like I see what this is and this is how this relates to this because I got I think I got into organizing with No Cop Academy around like 2017 and like 20 yeah 2017 um and like I said the schools were closed in 2013 
And so there is a bit of like a gap between like the schools closing and like me actually getting getting involved in organizing. Yeah. Um, but um, it was interesting and being at the new school and even at the old school, like I guess I was engaged in a lot of extracurriculars. I got into like writing spoken word and mm-hmm. poetry. And I would say like, that was the way in which like I was able to get, like give my testimonials like before I got into organizing mm-hmm. and just like to have a voice about like the type of things that were like going on in my community before that, that actually recognized like and had like the language to put what was what to it. And like, I say this all the time to people like, a lot of people are like, oh, like, you know, a lot of the youth don't really know what's going on. And I always like to say, like, like that that's not true. Like the a lot of times the youth like know exactly what's going on. They just don't know the language behind it because it's inaccessible. So like yeah. The fact that like growing up in Austin, like there isn't there's one grocery store and then you know, two most of the schools in the neighborhood got closed down. And the fact that there's like a lot of police, like we notice those type of things. We just don't have the language to say like, oh, this is gentrification or, oh, this is investment or, oh, this is over-policing until like we're able to gain access to that type of information. So like, we know what's happening. We just don't know like what to call it. So yeah. I would say like that was probably like the most like pivotal thing in my childhood was like having my uh middle school closed down because then I had to finish out like my sixth, my seventh, and my eighth grade year at uh, a new school. So Mm -hmm. that's Yeah, that's very interesting point. And also like you did do stuff with that information too, right? Like you were showing up at those hearings and, and I think that that's very powerful. I'm curious, you talk about the the gap between the school closures um, that you're impacted by and then your involvement in No Cop Academy. Um, so when you started getting involved with that organizing around the Cop Academy, were you in high school at that point? And like walk me through those initial like um, experiences as you went into the movement. So I didn't start organizing until I was in high school. So, you know, my sixth, my seventh, and my eighth grade years. I didn't do much, but like I said, sort of at that point, like art was sort of like, I guess my activism at Mm -hmm. that point. I remember my eighth grade year at my new school, um, I ended up winning valedictorian and Mm -hmm. the valedictorian got to like do a speech and all this other type of stuff. Um, And I was like, you know, I don't wanna do a speech. I wanna do a poem (laughs) or I wanna do a speech and a poem. And the poem that I was going to read, I wish I could find it. It was about gun violence. Mm. Um, And the teachers and the principal, they were sort of like, you know, that's not really the vibe, (laughs) you know, we're trying to go for, for like graduation. Like we wanted to be like an uplifting and celebratory thing. And I was like, yeah, I feel that. But also we need to like acknowledge the realities of like what's going on in our neighborhood. And so I did, I ended up, seeing the speech and reading a poem about like gun mm-hmm. violence within the city um and so you know I was conscious but I wasn't really you know in the streets because I was still like I was still a young man or whatever um yeah. and so high school I think I want to say sophomore year yeah is when I got involved with no cop so like I said majority of my life I lived um within the Austin community but at the beginning of my high school education, I moved to West Garfield Park, which is like one neighborhood over. Like, like in some some parts, you're in West Garfield Park, and across this part, you're in Austin. Like the lines are very, the way the lines are drawn within the city are very weird. So yeah. I was living in West Garfield Park, um, and I actually got the opportunity to go to school, to go to Whitney Young High School, which is a selective enrollment and a magnet school that you have to test into, Mm -hmm. Um, which is interesting because like, I feel like because of that, I was very privileged because a lot of people that like grow up within the Austin community don't get the same access to those types of resources that like the students that we can get. Like a lot of them are like from wealthy and upper class, you know, like type of students that like had tutors all their lives and got perfect SAT scores and so I think like the fact despite like how 
I would say CPS like felt me as a student, I was able to be successful. Like that's not the case for most students. Like, mm -hmm. you know, removing schools, like when you think about like students with learning disabilities or just like even students that like experience a lot of trauma in their day-to-day -day lives. Like for me, having my school closed down was a big deal because like I was really close to a lot of my teachers and mm -hmm. half of those people ended up being laid off. And it's like, these were like role models and like people who like the kids look to like as like confidants and things like that. So being able to go to Whitney Young was interesting. Like, I don't wanna sound like a cliche, but it was kind of like living between two worlds. You know what I mean? Like going to school every day and like having access to all these resources, but then like, it would like make me mad because I knew that once I went home, I wouldn't have access to those same resources. So it's like being mm -hmm. there, I was grateful, but I was kind of mad because it's like everybody should have access to these type of resources and they shouldn't have to travel outside of their community. That was the main thing, travel outside of their community to get them because I my ride to school was like 30 minutes plus every day. And mm -hmm. like the neighborhood school, Austin, is on literally like a two minute walk from my house. It's in the same block as my house, but there's like there's such a lack of resources there that I feel like I wouldn't be able to get like the the quality education that I deserve and that all of the students in Austin deserve as well. So going to Whitney Young was definitely interesting, also because of the fact that like the neighborhood that I grew up in was like predominantly black because mm -hmm. of the way that Chicago is so segregated and Whitney Young in and of itself is like very, for lack of a better word, diverse or quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, and very much so like a, an example, like a smaller example of like Chicago, like 25 is mm -hmm. 25, because the city is very, very diverse. It's just very segregated. And that's the exact, the, the exact experience that mm -hmm. I got going to high school because I thought that like, you know, because there were all these different types of people that there would be like some solidarity and inclusion, but like diversity and, and inclusion don't always go hand in hand. Like you can be diverse without being, you know, inclusive. And that's very much so like the vibe that I got going from my school, even when it came to like instances where like, so, you know, some students got into the school based off a tier system. And, you know, we didn't have all the access to the resources that some of, you know, the other students had. So it's like, even coming into these classes, like we're not all in an even playing field because we're coming from very different backgrounds, very different experiences. And so even when it came to like students struggling in classes, like it felt like there was no help. Like, oh, you, you got in here, so you got to do it by, you're by yourself now. Like getting us letting you in was like all we had to do. Mm -hmm. Or like, for example, there were like a lot, a lot, a lot of instances of like, racism within the school to the point where like my school would be like in the news for stuff that was happening and when black students within the school tried to organize there was sort of like pushback from the school and from the principal herself who was a black woman in regards to saying like you know this is what the real world is like you just have to deal with it and it's like it's like well this is not what the real world has to be is like the point that we're, we're trying to build the world that we want to live in and so saying that you know this is just what the real world is like is like being complicit in like the system and like what's going on and so I would say like I started to get into organizing a little bit like within my school um mm -hmm. and on that front and then I also got into organizing um through No Cop Academy and how I got um, into organizing through No Cap Academy is that I had knew like some folks at school who were like organizing with me on like the black stuff within school. Um, and they were a part of some other orgs like Asada's Daughters and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I would hear like word to mouth, they'd be talking about stuff that was going on. And I saw like on uh, social media that there was like a No Cop Academy teach in. And this was like like the first like, info, like community informational meeting mm -hmm. about No Cop Academy. And I had heard somebody in school talking about it. You know, they're trying to build this $95 million academy. And immediately I was like, no, 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 no. Like, yeah. because they were building, they were going to be building it in, the, in West Garfield Park, the neighborhood that I had moved to. And it, it really frustrated me because I was like, well, a few years ago, the city closed down all these schools because they claimed that they didn't have any money. And now here we are a few years later, and they want to build a $95 million plus mm -hmm. training academy in the same neighborhood that they closed down like three schools in. 
Like that makes no sense. And the yeah. thing that really frustrated me about it is that not only like where these schools closed down, they're just vacant buildings now. Like, I mean, I drive past my old school every single day, drive past Emmett, drive past Key School, and they're just there. Like they haven't been turned into anything. They haven't been torn down. They're just vacant buildings. And mm-hmm. that's like so frustrating. It's like we have, okay, if we're going to close them down, which we shouldn't, can we turn them into community centers or something like that? Instead, yeah. we want to invest our money into a $95 million police training academy. Um, and so that was like a big red flag for me. Also, because Whitney Young, the school that I had attended, was next door to the current police academy. Mm. So like whenever we would leave for lunch, all we would see is like a bunch of police trainings. And there would be instances where, you know, we're in class and like the, the police training academy um, they're doing like mock drills and stuff, but they wouldn't notify the school that they were doing mock drills. So like we'd hear gunshots and stuff like that. And then the principal like would come on an intercom and be like, oh, well, if you hear anything, that's just that's just the police training academy next door. They're just practicing. Or like, I very vividly remember this one instance where um, we were outside for like gym class P or whatever. And they were doing like, I don't know, like a mock, like robbery or like um mm. uh like a traffic stop they were doing a mock traffic stop that's what they were doing um and like the police train was literally like holding a gun up to this other guy who was pretending to be whoever he was pretending to be and i i was i remember asking my friend like yo like does he have a gun out now like this that, and other and my friend was like oh well yeah but like it has yellow tape around it so like that's how you know it's a fake and they're just doing a drill and I'm like that's ridiculous like that should not be happening the fact that we have to even know like that oh yellow tape means this that it's a drill like that's ridiculous so the fact that like the current police academy was next door to my school because we did have off campus lunch so we would like leave and go and so that's how we would see like a lot of the trainings doing their drills or whatever Mm -hmm. um and to have the current, the one that they're trying to build now be in the neighborhood that I live in, it's like, well, you know, I already live in a, pol- in a community that's heavily over police. So bringing a police training academy seems like to not be the very best use of like $95 million. It's like, I go to school, it's police. Like I come home, it's police. Like the community is police. Like it's like, there's no way to escape it. And like, that seems to only be the resource, the only resource that like black black and brown people within the city are worth like it's like police Mm -hmm. um and so that is like what frustrated me and I also remember like hearing my principal and like people around the school like have conversations having conversations about like combining like the current police academy with my school because they were sort of like next door to each other like my school had like three different bridges that connected three different buildings um as sort of like a thing to appease more students to like want to come to the school but it's like you're not appeasing to your black and brown students because that's not going to make us want to come to an institution like this and so I would say that's really what frustrated me so I think in like like I said in 2017 I like went to like the first like you know educational no cop um teaching or hey this is what ha- what's happening and I learned a lot and I was like, yeah, no, this is, this is not it. And then that was sort of kind of it. I really didn't do anything with it again. And then mm-hmm. like, and I think March or February of 2018, the next no cop thing that I ended up going to was a die-in at City Hall. <laughs> so that was such a, a large and drastic jump from just like going to teaching the first one to like four or five months later, the next thing that I went to was a die-in at City Hall. So I went to this Diana City Hall and it was during school hours, of course, because that's when all the city council meetings are. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it might have been during spring break because I remember it being in March. Um, mm-hmm. And I just went and there was like some, a few people from my school that I knew. And like I said, I had gotten a lot into like the poetry and art scene at mm-hmm. Chicago. So there were like a lot of people from orcs like Kumbalinks and stuff that I knew that like were getting involved. And so mm-hmm. I saw a couple of them there and I went there by myself and I remember they had an open mic um, and I had wrote a poem about 
you know, living in West Garfield Park and then not having any resources. And I was like, okay, I'll read this as an open mic. Um, and then sort of naturally, like, I just, like, fell into, like, a chant leader role. Mm. Um, and then at the end of that event, it was one of the adult al- allies who, you know, was organizing the NOCOP. Um, she was like, you know, you have really great energy. You know, you're a youth from West Garfield Park. Like, your voice is the voice that, like, this campaign needs, sort of. And she was like, I would love to connect with you. And I was like, sure. And then from that moment forward is basically how I got involved with no cop I just showed up to a random event I connected with some people and then I was sort of plugged in and she was like yo like I'm having like a um like a youth abolitionist internship in the summer and I would love like if you would be a part of it and I was like okay this sounds dope and then I did that and then from there forward is like how I got into uh no cop academy basically um yeah that's sort of like what started my connections um, that, sounds good. that sounds good and um could you tell me a bit about the work that or the education I guess or the learning that you were doing in that abolition summer internship um and then the kind of tangible like work that you guys were doing moving forward in that movement yeah so after that summer it's like every summer after that I did an internship <laughs> with the same and then at one point I like led my own like west side abolitionist like internship so like mm-hmm. I don't remember the specifics of like what we did within that internship but I remember a lot of it was like learning like like reading like black feminist text and like learning about abolition and mm-hmm. just like familiarizing ourselves with it and basically making the connections between like no cop academy and like like what this campaign could be slash will become and like abolition and like oh, mm-hmm. how that ties to it um and i remember it's like we did like so many different like internships we ended up doing one about like freedom of information acts and like mm-hmm. how you can like access the city for information that they were holding like information about the cop academy um mm-hmm. and all this stuff um, and so that was when I like I connected with other um, youth um, mm-hmm. and a lot of the youth that were like a part of this internship were not from the west side and so that was the first time where I was like wow like people all across the city care about this issue like I thought only the people that live on the west side like would be passionate about this we were like people from the mm-hmm. south side people from the north side um, and it wasn't just black youth, it was black and brown youth. And so that was another that was another like wow moment for me. Like, wow, like these people that like have never even lived in my community, like are advocating for it. And so that made me feel like heard and like really like motivated to like want to be a part of the movement. Mm-hmm. Um and within No Cop, there was like a lot, a lot that we tackled and we did. I think I'll say like one of the like biggest reasons that like I wanted to get involved as well is because of like the reasoning that like the mayor was like trying to like push Mm -hmm. forth the top academy and basically trying to use like Laquan McDonald like as an excuse to build a cop academy which I think is absolutely foul um and sort of like to push this narrative like hey you know the Chicago Police Department messed up with Laquan McDonald so like let's spend more money on them to get them better training so that that doesn't happen again instead of like addressing like the systemic issues of like the like policing department and police in general as a concept um and that was like really frustrating to me because the Kwame Donald was like a young black man who was like around my age and it's like that could have been any of us and like to use his story um, of like as a catalyst for like pro-police like propaganda was yeah. like not okay with me especially considering like the ways in which Laquan McDonald was failed like by the system and the fact that like black youth are in the city are trying to rectify those same issues of like how the system is failing black youth it's like no like that's the real issue um and so yeah the campaign was like we never expected it to be like almost three years or for it to get like the amount of attention that it did. Um, and I would say that like No Cop Academy really like changed like the face of like the city of Chicago. And like, mm-hmm. like there have, there's like Chicago has a radical organizing history, but it being black and brown youth led was the new aspect of it. 
Yeah. Um, and basically what we wanted to do with No Pop Academy was just like change the narrative that like policing equals community safety. Um, because at the end of the day, we wanted to like let people know that like this, this idea that like police make community safer, it's like, well, if that was the case, Chicago is one of the most heavily policed places in, in, the, uh, in the United States. So if police make community safer, then Chicago would be one of the safest places in the United States, but it's not <laughs> because they show up after the fact and that they don't address like the root issues of like what causes violence, like, you know, housing insecurity, like lack of access to education, like mm-hmm. unemployment and all these things and like black youth within the city you were trying to have been trying to advocate for since and before like the closing of all these schools. And so, yeah, in addition to that, like this idea that like with reform, like the police can, you know, be better. It's like, well, no, well, we have to recognize that the system is inherently flawed. Um, and like when the whenever like a, a mayor like for the city of Chicago is running, the main thing that they like to run their platform on is like, oh, we're gonna stop the gun violence and you know, we're gonna make the community safer. But it's like we're not talking to like the talking to communities to ask them what makes them feel safe. We're just operating under the assumption that like police make people feel safer. And it's like no, well, police make a certain type of, a certain demographic feel safe. The communities that are the most violent and impacted by this violence don't feel safer by police presence. And in addition to that, I would say the other main layer of it is this fact that like the way in which the city prioritizes, you know, things like the, the police department has always gotten the majority of the budget where things like, you know, housing, And like, you know, like, oh, we're closing down 50 plus schools, but the Chicago police, because we don't have enough money, but the Chicago police department is still getting over 40% of the budget. It's Mm -hmm. like, you know, and and, and increasingly every year, but like increasingly the city is not getting safer. So it's like, when do we actually take a look and realize that like, for like the, back then, like when we were, uh, when we first started No Pop Academy, the Chicago police department was getting about 40% of the budget. Um, and that averaged out to like four million dollars a day. It's like as a city and as black and brown students, if you think about what we could do with four million dollars a day, we can make real change. But instead, we're just giving that money to, you know, we're just throwing away money, essentially. Um, and that ended up being like one point four billion dollars a year. It's like mm-hmm. think about what we can do with one point four billion dollars a year if we invested it and to where it needed to be invested and like even in 2020 that number had went up from like 1.4 billion to 1.8 billion so like it's just consistently on the rise but like things like you know the schools aren't getting more funding tps isn't getting more funding like we're making cuts teachers are getting laid off like the union is striking (laughs) like you know what i mean so it's like it, it like shows that like the police are like the first class citizens in the city and then everybody else is like a second class citizen and it shows like what the city is prioritizing because almost because a majority of the money that's coming in within the city is going to that entity that isn't really you know doing its job to like make the city safer and so we wanted to change the narrative around like what safety meant um this idea that policing automatically means safer communities and really like talk to the communities because one thing is that like, you know, the mayor and the, and the city council, they would say, you know, like, oh, you know, the people, the people want um, this um, police academy. And it's like, well, when we went to the community and door knocked and talked to a lot of people, most people didn't even know what was happening. So mm-hmm. it's like, y'all definitely aren't talking to the same people that we're talking to because one, most people didn't know that this was happening. Um, yeah. because of the way that they tried to like soft launch it over fourth of july weekend and like all this other stuff and two when we asked them like you know do you think there's a better use of 95 million dollars a majority of them said yes and even had recommendations as to what they thought would be a better use of the money so it's like we aren't really talking to the people in the community and like within no pop academy we really tried to like like, for example, like, when you think about, like, the neighborhoods that I lived in, like, um, the people under the mayor that have the most amount of impact are going to be the aldermen, right? 
these are black people who aren't representing the values of the black people within the community, right? These are people that were very pro police and very pro close school down, very pro like all these decisions that like aren't consulting the community with. And so with that, we also had to like do a lot of like talking to like our city council members and letting them know like that this doesn't reflect the interests of the community, especially the one in which excuse me, the cop academy was gonna be built in. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just like a lot of things that like no cop uh, tackled. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like I'm one of the main things, one of the uh, main catalysts for like the city proposing this cop academy is because after the killing of Laquan McDonald, the Department of Justice did an investigation with the Chicago Police Department. And mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff they found was like that they just were one are corrupt, which we already knew, but like, for it, it, it was like from macro scale things to micro scale things to like the fact that like they leave their guns unlocked like in some of their in some of, in the in the current police training academy or the fact that like a police train like legally a police training facility isn't supposed to be near a school mm -hmm. um and the one that the current one was by my school and the new one that they were trying to build was going to be across the street from or academy which is a predominantly black high school which also happens to be the high school that both my parents went to so mm -hmm. it was like there are all these connections between me and the cop academy and like why i wanted to get involved and so i think no cop academy did a good job like we were able to have a campaign that was endorsed by like over 100 organizations within the city you know mm -hmm. what i mean um, and even still, the city decided to, you know, vote against ours. And also, No Cop Academy, like, sort of, like, was a catalyst for, like, all of these other, like, defund, larger defund movements that, like, are sweeping across the country now, like, the defund Chicago, I have the fund the you can't see it, but, like, literally, the fund the mm -hmm. police, uh, CPD, like, uh, initiative that happened in Chicago, like, that was because of No Cop, and that was with, like, a lot of No Cop people, or if you think of, like, even broader scale today, um, the Stop Cop City um, campaign that's happening in Atlanta, those folks have said time and time again that No Cop Academy is what inspired them. Um, mm -hmm. And that they've take, they took they taken from our toolkit or our strategy to help inform their movements. So um, I think, you know, we were able to like shake things up and like really like also make like this idea of like what the black and brown youth want as like a political issue. So like whenever the like there was not like a mayoral forum that you could go to and not hear about cop academy and are you gonna divest from the police or invest from the police or are you gonna are you gonna fund this? Are you gonna erase the gang database? Are you gonna like we we had fire under every politician's ass like um mm -hmm. and especially given that like it was sort of like on the brink of like election season. And yeah. this was at the time when Miss Lori Lightfoot <laughs> was running her campaign, but I'm not even gonna get into her because we could talk about her for a whole hour and a half in and of itself. But yeah, yeah so yeah, that's basically. I think um, that's very powerful. And, and like, I, I think to your point about how No Cop Academy really like one sh showed the hypocrisy of like a lot of the reasonings why it was supposedly being proposed versus like and then trying to like really put in the fact that like what black and brown youth in the city are asking is like very important and also related to all these other movements that are to come right um and so i'm curious like in that space like what the dynamics were between like different organizers i know you mentioned like going to these and having these internships and stuff and you mentioned someone being like an adult ally so i'm curious if you could talk about the organizations that were involved your relationships to the organizations and also the different individuals in the movement yeah so i feel like i say this all the time like i think no cop academy being like sort of like my first like experience with organizing was like a uh, like very unique experience from like how a lot of other organizing happens in big cities and like in the ways in which like a lot of like organizations like not even organizations but organizations and campaign like claim to like be fighting in the interest of the youth but there's no youth in the room at the mm -hmm. time it's just like a bunch of adults speaking for like youth but like 
not actually <laughs> involving the youth in the process. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say that like, it was very like sort of like non-hierarchical, which I appreciated, but also just very unfamiliar. Like I remember when there would be times where it was like, all right, we're gonna plan this action or like, let's talk about campaign strategy. And I would be like, y'all not gonna tell us <laughs> like like I'd be like so what do you mean we come up with it all by ourselves you know what I mean because it's so foreign like in like a capitalist society where it's like there's there's an adult and there's a, or like there's always some type of power dynamic right and so for there not to be like as like like a concrete power dynamic was so unfamiliar to me especially like as a young person because I was like like you know I don't have all the answers like I don't know how to do all this shit, but like, I guess that's like, that like allowed me to like, look like more to like history and like dive more into like theory and like feminist texts because oftentimes like the answers that we're looking for, like people have wrote about this, you know, like this isn't, this isn't somebody's first time saying like, you know, we should abolish the police, you know, abolition isn't a new concept even like abolition comes from like slavery, like abolition Um, and like, yeah, it was just like so unfamiliar to me, but also like so empowering because it's like at the end of the day, the young people are the future. And it's like, I feel like we don't give ourselves enough credit. Like actually sitting in a room and brainstorming with a bunch of other youth, like we have all the, the solutions right here. You know what I mean? Like we we are very smart, we're powerful, and like we can see things from a perspective that maybe like older folks who are like more set in their ways or like haven't had the same experiences as us. We can see stuff in a different light. And so it was really empowering to be able to be in a room with like other youth and to be organizing without like having to depend on like, you know, like, oh, or like even like, let's say if we want to plan an action, we wouldn't like have to be like, oh, well, can we do this? It's like, no, we're going to do it. Like, let's do it. Like, we don't yeah. need approval from anyone like but ourselves. And I think because of the fact that, then that just made me think of something like, because of the fact that no cop economy was primarily youth youth run youth led is why we got so much pushback like from city council and things of that sort because they didn't take us seriously right there were times where like Lori Lightfoot and and like Emma Mitts who's like my alderman they were like oh you know y'all just a bunch of young kids like making noise roo roo rah rah and y'all don't really know what you're talking about and it's like actually we know exactly what we're talking the facts are here or there would be cases where uh other people would say things like you know oh you know y'all don't really think that y'all just got adults planning stuff Mm -hmm. into y'all's head it's like no this is all us like these are our lived experiences like i i don't i you know i believe in the divestment of the police because i have direct experiences with it like that's nobody like that's my lived experience that's nobody telling me you know what to think or what and like it's like also it's like politics aside like this is like this this is not about politics it's about our lives you know what I mean like yes it's a political issue because that's the way that society has made it but it's not about like if we're liberal or conservative like it's it's not about that it's about like are you providing for black youth or are you not you know what I mean it's like you're on the right side of history or you're on the wrong side of history like is this is very much so a polarizing issue um and so like yeah there would be yeah we got a lot of pushback because of the fact that like we were youth owned uh not youth owned sorry youth ran um mm-hmm. and folks were like not taking us seriously but like the dynamics of this sort of looked like you know the youth were doing all this stuff on the ground and I would say like the only things that the adults really did is like the stuff that the youth couldn't do uh because they're more established so like when it came the things like suing the city I can't fucking sue the city I have not like you know what I mean yeah. like whereas there's people who like have went to law school and like know how to do things like yeah. sue the city you know what I mean like the the stuff that we couldn't do because we didn't have access to those resources yet but like all of the organizing all the strategizing all the planning like that was sitting in a room for hours with people sitting on zoom calls because the pandemic happened at one point you know mm-hmm. what I mean um so that was the interesting dynamic of it and like having those like uh hundreds of like endorsing organizations we were able to like play into that too like okay what does this org do all right let's use their strengths to help like you know everybody building off their strengths versus like everybody working on the same thing or like working uh clashing whereas like let's 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 maximize off like 
the people that we have on our side you know what I mean um Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I would say like that was like the primary like difference but like there was not really like a you know power dynamic it wasn't like the adult allies and and the youth were like fighting for power in the situation Mm -hmm. it's like we're all at the end of the day um if we want to be successful in like building the world that we have to live in that we want to live in it's going to be an intergenerational struggle you know what I mean um but at the yeah like it's going to be intergenerational and not you know intergenerational in a way that like it's youth and it's adults but the adults are only speaking for the youth Mm -hmm. no like intergenerational in the fact that like it's a learning experience for the both of us like Mm -hmm. just as I can say I learned a lot from the adult allies the adult allies can say that they learned a lot from the youth in the academy at the same time Mm -hmm. so yeah I think like that being my first campaign is really interesting because like it kind of sort this it set the standard of like the type of organizing that like I want to be a part of because mm-hmm. not a lot of people can say that their first organizing experience was something like that you know what I mean yeah. and yeah. even post no pop academy I was able to get into like top side of CPS um and then I was able to get into deep on TPD you know what I mean I was able to get into the centers you know and all this other stuff that like is working to like make sure that like youth are at the forefront of the movement because at the end of the day we are the ones that are going to be impacted first and foremost by mm-hmm. these issues because we have the longest amount of time to you know build the world that we want to live in so yeah. I think that's beautiful and and also like when you're speaking about um really the the strength of no cop academy being a coalition and being able to tap into different like um organizations and their strengths like um you probably don't remember this at all but i remember distinctly the first time that i like was aware of no cop academy was when you and a couple of other organizers i think were in asada's daughters um came into a meeting in uptown for this org that i was a part of named kinetic and it was like a bunch of us oh like, i remember that Oh and it was like a, it was like a popular education workshop or something like that. Um, and so I, I think that really like resonates with me, this idea of like this campaign really reaching different people across the city. Um, do you like and I know oftentimes with organizing, you usually kind of have an entry point through one organization or you kind of latch on to one organization and then work in coalition spaces. Did you feel like you had that experience? Right. Um, yeah. No, I would say that, like, that's definitely, like, one of, like, the most interesting things, like, uh, about being a part of No Cup Academy is because I was not attached to, like, any particular organization, but, like, a lot of my peers were, and so, like, Mm -hmm. whenever we would do things or whenever I would do something, folks would be like, yeah, you know, she's a part of Asada's Daughters, or yeah, she's a this, like, actually, like, I'm not, Um, but I would say, like, it, it, it wasn't, um, like, intentional that I wasn't a part of any particular organization because I had a lot of connections with um, organizations at the end of the day, like a lot of it just came down to like accessibility. So like, for example, Asada's Daughters is predominantly based on the South side of the city, like in Hyde Park. And I live far, far West and to even go to that part of the city takes about two hours. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, And so like Asada's Asada's Daughter was like the primary, um, the primary organization that was like, behind No Cop Academy and a lot of the peer, like most of the, my peers that are organized with were part of No Cop Academy but were part of Asada's Daughters but that's part of like what I was saying earlier about how like No Cop Academy was organized by folks from all around the city because most of the people that were part of Asada's Daughters were from the south side of the city sure. um, um, whereas there were some of us there from the west side or like, you know, from Northwest or like, you know, heart of the city. And then there were a lot of like Lat- Latinx um, allies who were like a part of BPNC. And I also organized with a lot of those folks, but I also was not a part of BPNC because I didn't live in Brighton Park. And there was sort of like, I wouldn't say that there was like an integral like West Side org, or there, there was, but it wasn't like as youth prominent as like the other org and so I didn't end up being a part of any particular org but like the org that I told you that like kind of brought me into no cop and like I did the internship but that's like AFSC American Friends Service Community like uh, mm-hmm. a, a white Quaker org that originated a long long time ago you know mm-hmm. what I mean and so it was interesting not being a part of an org because it was kind of frustrating because I like kind of wanted to be a part of an org you know because everybody else is and it's like you know people group me into one anyways but 
um, also like what organizations come organizational issues. And so I wasn't like really tripping to like find a org home because it's like, I kind of have a home in all of these orgs, you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess like before we talk a bit more about you entering into other organizing spaces after no cop, um, could you speak a little bit about relationship building? Like if there's anything vivid that comes up in terms of like, relationships that you built through your introduction to no cop yeah um i would say like relationship building in regards to like just going into the community and like building relationships with the people in the community because oftentimes like you know as organizers you know we see an issue you know that we're passionate about and we are like no like this is not going to happen we want to fight against this but sometimes I feel like we need to ask ourselves like am I the right person to be fighting for this you know what I mean because oftentimes we're a part of campaigns that don't really have people that represent the community as a part of the campaign and so like for like community building aspect of it like going going out west and like knocking on the doors and like talking to the people like of the community and seeing like what they have to say about it because at the end of the day it's great to have like you know solidarity like across the city but like what does it mean if like there's no representation from the people within the neighborhood and we mm. don't know what they feel and so I feel like that's why it was really important for us to um to make the pamphlet that we made the, the no pop mm -hmm. academy survey of like what the people in the community thought and have to, to have testimonials from them and to have like a big release party for um, this on the West side in a church, um, because that's, um, I would say like, that was like, that's like the main difference between like the organizing on the South side of the city and the organizing that occurred within the West side of the city. Historically, is that a lot of the organizing that occurred within the West side of the city was church based, based mm -hmm. in the church. And so that's why like the dynamics of like trying to pull people into the movement on the West side is like a little bit different than what it looks like if you live on the South side of the city. But that yeah. also speaks to like how segregated the city is in and of itself and that like things are so different depending on where you live but like being able to like make relationships with people like you know all different types of people like teachers like pastors like community members like like cook county commissioners <laughs> you know what i mean mm -hmm. um yeah so like it, it spoke to like the fact that like this is not like just young people doing it and also just added to like our narrative because I remember that one of the main things that like the city would say about the cop academy is that you know it's going to bring jobs into the community and it's mm. like like oh you guys don't want jobs on on the on the west side it's like well yeah we need teachers <laughs> you know what I mean not yeah. people to uh to take care of a police to sweep the floors in a police training facility you know what I mean or yeah we have all these people that are unemployed why is the only resource for employment is when it's tied to policing and that's another thing like that the mayor and like specifically the aldermen of the west side tried to do they would say they would use this sort of like difference in dynamics on the south side and the west side of the city to use against us and so they would be like oh you know the south side gets a lot more resources and like a lot more opportunities in regards to this and this and that you know they're getting the obama library or whatever and all this other stuff and they have all this stuff but the west side doesn't have nothing and so mm -hmm. they're like, oh, you guys don't want the West Side to have anything. Like, this is the one thing, that, this is the one big investment the West Side has had in a long time. And it's the cop, you just a copy. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what we're saying. We're not saying we yeah. don't want investment on the West Side. We could have been had investment on the West Side, but why is the only investment we get police? Like, that's the issue of it. Like, we're not saying, you know, we don't want money, we don't want jobs, but why is it that we only get those things when they're tied? this institution that doesn't serve the people of the community you know what I mean and yeah. sort of so like that's like the main thing that they tried to use to like try and like frame us as the bad people you know they don't want investment on the west side or they don't want jobs and it's like no we do but we've been wanting investment we want an investment when you guys close down the 50 schools you know what I mean mm -hmm. um and so even like when there was like talks in the future like after the campaign was officially over of like um combining the boys and girls club with the no cop with the cop academy it's like okay. people, the mayor was like oh you know you guys don't want a bro boys and girls club like the boys and girls club brings resources it's like well we can have a boys and girls club but 
why does it need to be inside of a police training facility? Like then you're going to alienate the people that need those resources most because they're not going to feel safe coming to a boys and girls club if it's within a police training facility. You know what I mean? So yeah, they are really tricky. I mean, not tricky, but sneaky with how they try and like to like paint us as the bad people and like the language that they choose to use. But at the end of the day, it's just like, like we want investment, like we want jobs. It's just not these ones. Like why are these the only ones? So it's like, we get this or nothing. Like, how is that, how's that productive? You know what I mean? So Yeah, that's so true. And did you feel like this frustration um, and also strategy on their end continued throughout the other organizing you became a part of? Because I'm curious, like, what it looked like after the campaign was officially over. And then, yes, yeah. So, the Boys and Girls Club thing that was way after the campaign was over. The campaign yeah. ended in like ended in like 2019. The Boys and Girls Club was like in 2021. This they were yeah. like, okay. Uh, so the Top Academy was supposed to be built, I think, by 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, but because of the campaign, they just finished it. This I think the end of last year, like December. So we were able to delay it being built by like four or five years. Like it was supposed to be done and finished. But because of our our movement, that didn't happen. Um, and the talk about com- adding the Boys and Girls Club but to it, that was like, that's like recent history. Um, and so the use of like this narrative that like, uh, you know, we don't want resources on the West side and, and polarizing the South, like that's new. And even still to this day, it's like, that same type of like narrative to paint us as the bad guys, like, you know, oh, they don't want more police. They, they don't want the city to get safer. Is it basically mm-hmm. what they're saying? And it's like, first, that's not true because if you listen to us, it's like we have personal experience with violence in ourselves. Like I have a cousin that was killed from gun violence in 2022 or in 2021. Yeah, in 20, October of 2021. It's like, why wouldn't I want the city to be safer? It's just a means of like, when you talk about police it's like they show up after the crime has already been committed like they didn't stop my cousin from getting killed you know what I mean Mm -hmm. they come after the fact you know what I mean and so yeah this narrative of it's it's like this the the politicians and like the city itself try and paint us as like people who like don't have feelings and like don't have any attachment to these issues like we're just talking about them and like we don't live them on a day-to-day basis Mm -hmm. and it's like that just shows in and of itself that y'all aren't listening to us because we have the most experience with these things you know what I mean we wouldn't be fighting about it if we didn't you know so yeah with these types of interactions and stuff like it's very easy for and no cop academy being as big as it was it's very easy for organizers to get burnt out and like honestly like give up when when you don't see the kind of like radical change that you're fighting for i'm curious then how you felt after it ended um and what brought you to the other like campaigns that you became involved yeah. so i felt a lot of stuff <laughs> um a lot of different things. So I'll I'll speak to like two particular different things that like two different examples that I guess will speak to how I felt. So one being the day of the vote, um, mm-hmm. when city council, you know, decided, you know, if it's gonna pass the Catholic Academy or not, we brought out like over five hundred people to city council. It was packed. They were on some grimy stuff, of course. They wasn't trying to let us in. They know we were there to support. Um, a couple of us youth were able to get into the inside and I was one of them mm-hmm. um and then once they find when, when it came time for them to do the vote or whatever we you know we did a mic check and they they essentially like dragged us out um mm-hmm. like like they're like city hall is like um it's soundproof so like the people on the outside that they were making noise and stuff but it's soundproof but we could hear them <laughs> like and city council was like obviously getting annoyed by that um and you know they dragged me and a couple of youth out and so they dragged us out and then there was a point where we were at the stairs and we could like see all the other people that they didn't let in. And so we were like, okay, well, well y'all kicked us out. Like, let us, let us go to our peoples. Um, and they were like, oh no, you guys have to leave. Like you have to leave the building. Like you can't go back to with those people or whatever. And, you know, they dragged us down this hall and eventually they ended up like beating me and a, a, and a bunch of other black people, like literally like, 
physically harming me and other black youth like within city council chambers so like one of the one of the, one of our youth ended up like getting arrested we had to go do jail support like it was crazy i had to go to work right after that like it was crazy. i was bleeding like it was a whole thing and i was like okay so like that one situation is like in and of itself is like shows like how i felt about the thing it was like it was such a slap on the face because it's like also, while while city council was voting to pass this, you know, no cop academy ordinance, Lori Lightfoot was like somewhere else talking, or, or she was like, I don't know if she had did this like right before the city council meeting or like the night before, but this is, she had talked, this is when she had like made a joke, I don't know if you're serious or not, about like turning all the closed schools into mini cop academies. This was the same day as the vote. <laughs> and this is the same day as they're voting as Lori Life was saying that as black youth are being beat within city hall, city council. Um, and so it was just like such a slap in the face is like, that's how, it was one reason how I felt because it was like, what did we do all this work for? And y'all, y'all like that, that instance of like them being black youth basically shows like, it's like they're being rewarded for their behavior. Like this is how they operate and they're being rewarded with a brand new, brand new shiny school with a pool in it, with a pool table in it, with a game room you know, for this type of behavior. So it was really frustrating for me because I was super burnt out. Like you talk about burnout, I was so burned out. I was doing all this no cop organizing. I had like two jobs. I was like president of the Poetry Slam Club, president of African-American Culture Club. And I felt like I didn't get to be a kid because I was in the damn streets every day. And it's like all of the work that we had done was in vain. But then after that off there, you know, all the emotions are down. Like, okay, well, people always ask us like, oh, you know, how do you feel about it and it's like oh how do you feel that you know losing and I'm and I'm like well we didn't lose we won period like we changed like we changed the narrative within the city and so even though they still voted to you know approve the top academy or whatever for one it was supposed to have been rebuilt and it still ain't built and two we changed the narrative and we built a coalition of like black and brown youth that are not going nowhere and that's way bigger than us like winning winning or losing this campaign like the coalition that we built is forever you know what i mean um and so that's the one thing the other thing that like represents like how i felt about it post is i got the opportunity wow to open up for Bernie Sanders um, mm -hmm. and talk about No Cop Academy, um, mm -hmm. which was so crazy because it's like, one, we, we don't like politicians over here. <laughs> and politicians is, will never save us. Like, that is not the way. Like, we have to organize on the ground. But two, it was crazy to be able to put No Cop Academy on a national platform, being just like Black, like poor Black and brown youth in a room with an idea to like, how big the campaign got to like being able to like have our story broadcasted on CNN. I'm like, oh, so it, it don't look like we lost to me because, <laughs> because we did it. Um, and after that, I was like, I don't know. I was having a serious, like, do I ever want to organize again? Like mm -hmm. not because like we lost, but just because of like how taxing it was. But then I realized it was like, it was taxing because we didn't plan right. Like we didn't expect for it to go as crazy, but like, that's like the nature of organizing. Like you never know what's gonna happen. And so I feel like just being a kid, like I wasn't thinking about like, you know, oh, I need to go slowly so that I can maintain my health and my adult year, you know, and all this type of stuff. So um, after that, I was like super burnt, like super burned out. And I still, that's crazy though, cause I didn't stop. I kept, I kept doing stuff. <laughs> I got involved with like cops out of CPS and like CPD, defund CPD. But like, I think like that's just the nature. It's a bad, it's a bad culture and like a bad nature of organizing, but also like the nature of like just being a black woman organizer in general. Like we don't allow ourselves any time to like rest or take a break. Mm -hmm. um, and I also feel like it's like low key, like, a like anxiety slash depression thing like mm -hmm. you don't want to slow down so like you just bury yourself like in your work mm -hmm. um but I like started to realize that like it's not about like going super hard because like at the end of the day this, we want longevity in this movement and if we all burn ourselves out then there's no longevity so we have to like take our time and like take time for self-care but like being a student and an organizer and having to pay the bills and capitalism, all that, like it's really hard to like have that type of time. And it's like, that's 
But it's like, that's also the motivation to keep going because that's why we want this better world where we don't have to do all this stuff and like fight for all this stuff and just be able to like exist with the trees. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, but I feel like because of like my early on organizing experience, despite like how amazing it was and the, despite the fact that like I'm still doing it now, I feel like it's sort of like shifted like my role like in the movement. And so like I'm in school now studying sociology and psychology, but like I plan to like be a teacher or educator with that like degree or whatever. So yeah. like my role in the movement is like, I still have a role, but like, it's just a little bit different. And I still plan to like be on the ground and doing all the other stuff, but like to primarily like put my focus like into education. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's one thing like people like that's like a common misconception about organizing that like you have to always be on the ground and doing this and that but it's like there is so there are so many roles within the movement like digital mm-hmm. organizing like we need artists we need photographers we need people to make graphics you know we need people to teach you know so yeah I feel like I don't I feel like me early on like getting burned out but like still continuing because top side of CPS was a whole nother thing that we can get into yeah. um but it's like I don't know it feels like it's shifted sort of like what I want to do mm. and how I want to be present yeah that's very powerful I guess like hearing that you also want to go into maybe like teaching I'm mm-hmm. curious like and you're doing this organizing no cop academy and also cops out cps that has a lot to do with like cps and cpd and the whole time you're a CPS student. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, like, how you felt like all of that organizing informed your relationship with that institution itself. Yeah, so, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like CPS just is terribly misguided <laughs> and, like, fails all these students. And, like, so for me, like I said, I got into organizing, like, through, like, meeting someone, but, like, I probably had would not have known about, you know, No Cop Academy if I didn't go to Whitney Young. Like, mm-hmm. had I gone to my Austin neighborhood school, I probably wouldn't have known that it was happening. So the fact that, like, some of this, like, organizing or, like, it's, and it's nobody's fault. It's intentional that the people in that neighborhood don't know that this thing is happening. Like, that's, it's intentional. It's nobody's fault. But I feel like, you know, this sort of access to, like, radical feminist texts or, like, like, in this, like, idea of like abolition and like all these things to like build the world that we want to to live in and see I feel like all of that should be accessible within the school like you shouldn't have to go outside of school to get that information um because a lot of people are not going to have access to do that um and so I feel like that's part of the reason why I want to be an educator I feel like in a lot of ways I'm already an educator and like a facilitator and so I feel like being able to bring like sort of like the organizing experience that I got into the schools is mm-hmm. like what we need to make the world a better place. But I don't want to do it on like a like higher like academic level, like a college or like a professor, because like mm-hmm. that's that's a whole system that's complicit within it. And that's completely that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. Um, that's inaccessible like with the academic jargon but being able to like bring it to like the regular city kids who like would normally not have access to the type of information because like I said it's like they already know what's going on they just don't have like the verbiage to match it to their experiences yeah. so I feel like I kind of yeah I've like sort of like gone back and forth from like wanting to be a teacher and like a, a psychologist because you also see some of the same like growing up it's this you see I feel like being being a teacher is like being a teacher and a psychologist in one yeah. low-key with all the trauma that you see um from just young children in general yeah. but yeah so I feel like my my life and has informed like what I want to do like mm-hmm. from my own personal experiences and trauma to like CPS and CPD and all the organizing and everything else yeah that's really powerful and like I I think as someone who also wants to go into education like in the future I think a lot about how organizing taught me about the kinds of adults I needed um, during my childhood and like finding a lot of that in organizing spaces and not necessarily in formal education um and you so you mentioned how like before you even got involved in no cop you're doing a bit of organizing work in your school 
Um, could you talk a bit about like your relationship with administration starting then and also throughout the rest of your high school career? Um, and I know you said COP Academy, like COPS out CPS is like a whole thing in and of itself, but if we could get a little bit um, of, of just kind of that experience and how it relates to that relationship you had with your school. Yes, so um, my relationship with admin at my high school was very hostile. And I would say the opposite of like what my relationship was to adults in my organizing spaces. Mm -hmm. um, just because of like the school represents it in its institution it ended up it with itself. And like, also this is a common theme that I see across institutions from like the city of Chicago to my high school to Howard University that I attend now is that like all these places are like sort of like and mostly not invested in like doing the best thing that serves you know their students or their residents the best but doing the thing that looks the best mm -hmm. so like my high school just like the city of Chicago just like my university all are like obsessed with like reputation and like how things look and so as long as things look good, even if they aren't good, like that's what they're going for. And that was very much so the case, like with that's like, I would say the pushback that I've experienced like the most as an organizer and as a student is that by being an organizer that is like pushing it back on an issue, you're basically saying that like the reputation, like you're basically calling into question the reputation, like of the institution, of the school or whatever. And that in and of itself makes you a target because you're going against the image, the perfect or the good image that the school wants to put out. So mm -hmm. for example, my high school being diverse was one of its main selling points. And it's like, okay, well, here I am saying like, yeah, we diverse, but we're not inclusive. They're like, well, whoa, 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 whoa. Like that's, we want people to come here. You can't be saying stuff like that. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so just like this idea that like, if you're a part of the institution that you can't be critical of it, is like where I experienced like a lot of pushback in high school and even in college now organizing because it's like, you're basically calling people out on their BS, you know, and nobody mm -hmm. wants to do that. And so within my high school, even having a black principal, I thought that like, it would be a black woman principal that it would be easier to like come to her like with these issues of like, this is, this is like, hey, all this racist stuff is happening in school. Um, but it wasn't because at the end of the day, it was like by saying that I'm coming for her reputation and sort of like calling into question her role and her job as principal, which is true. I was because <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But like That's hard for people um, to recognize. And so, yeah, like, yeah. And I would say another main thing to like for like my relationship with administration within my school through organizing is like the main thing that they tried to teach is just like that you have to be tolerant of like the racism and like whatever the issue was versus like, you know, this idea that like, you don't have to be tolerant of it because it's not okay. And mm -hmm. like being tolerant of tolerant is like sort of like, just because you're in a room with people of like different racial backgrounds, socioeconomic classes, all these things that like you have to put up with, you know, um, BS basically which it's like I understand the context that there, there's always going to be some sort of something just because people are coming from different backgrounds that I understand but at a certain point like it's a difference to be like unconscious of your bias and be, and wanting to be willing to learn than like being yeah. willfully ignorant um and perpetuating balance because at the end of the day it's like it is violence and like that would be the thing that like the principal would say like oh you know they're, they're just words or they're just actions and it's like no these are the people that grow up and like become politicians and like affect our day-to-day -day lives like this is why we're living in the situations that that we're living in now these are people that come police become police officers or educators and, you mm -hmm. know and ban critical race theory you know what I mean so it's like yeah and so that that was sort of opposite of like the relationship that I had with like my organizing allies because we talk to them with the issue and they'd be like, all right, what we gotta do? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Versus yeah. the school like, all right, you can just, or like the main thing that like my principal would tell the black students, oh my God, is that we were being emotional, right? Um, yeah, so that like sort of thing of like having your feelings invalidated by institutions. And it's like, you're supposed to like, 
you can't sell your school on diversity when like all this stuff is happening because diversity means nothing if everybody is segregated. Like the city of Chicago is diverse, but the reason black and brown communities are void of resources is because it's segregated. So having different people in a room doesn't do anything if y'all aren't working together to gain some sort of understanding of each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, I would say my experience with cops at a CPS was, I would say, a little different than like my other, uh, my comrades' experiences with cops at a CPS because of the like, the, the fun, like I said, my school was like very well resourced Mm -hmm. and 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 had all the adequate resources where some other people's schools that they went to the like neighborhood schools so like I feel like had I been organizing at Austin Academy and trying to get you know the cops out of my school would be very different than like if I was organizing at my high school and also it was different too because like the cop academy was next door so it's like there are like a lot of different dynamics but um organizing cops out of CP it was also interesting too because despite the fact that like my school was like very um you know diverse um both of the cops well all the cops that worked in my school were black and so mm -hmm. that was another thing that we faced pushback on like especially you know, talking to the principal and trying to go to the local school council um to get these cops out of the out of cps it was like oh well, well they're black like you do you still have a problem with them it's, yeah 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 i do like it's, they're, it's not the individual person it's the system that they serve and a lot of people didn't understand that but um we did we had massive efforts at my school to like get the cops out of our school like we did a survey so my school had like almost three thousand students we got a survey of like over 800 students to say that they didn't want the cops in the schools anymore. We were organizing with the local school council and also trying to like have solidarity with art. What so organizing within my school is so unique because it's like in a pillar of like selective enrollment and magnet schools. And so we were trying to like organize with other selective enrollment and magnet schools because those tend to be the schools with the most resources. And also I would say because they are the most diverse, they are the schools that have more experiences of racism versus like if I went to my neighborhood school where there's all black students, you know what I mean? Um, so, so yeah, that was interesting. Um, and also, yeah, it was just really interesting because this was like after no cop and I, there weren't many people in my high school that were involved in no cop, but like there were a lot more people from my school that were involved with cops out of CPS. And I don't know if that's because like they saw no cop and like what it did, or if like maybe it's just because it was like closer to the summer of 2020 when everybody was just like ready to mess stuff up. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was interesting. And um, also, yeah. Uh, so there is this, yeah, that was an interesting moment um, because I was also not only trying to organize like in my school, but to try and get schools within the Austin community, like people who had students who attended these schools to also come mm -hmm. into like cops out of CPS and get them to like organize within their schools. Um, yeah. Because I feel like a lot of like, it's, 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 it's it's been harder to like pull West Side people into like these type of movements. So to, to try and make sure like that that voice was there. So like there is this um, guy called Dwayne Trust who was on like the board of education, like um, their primary board, the people who who like decide the funding for like mm -hmm. that goes from CPD within CPS. Um, mm -hmm. And he actually uh, lived in Austin lived in Austin he like went to Austin high school he was like involved with a lot of stuff on the west side but at the same time voting <laughs> to you know keep the keep a 60 million 30 million dollar contract between CPD and, and CPS and so uh my primary focus was in class out of CPS was making him a target and trying to connect with him because he was somebody that had direct ties to the west side of Chicago and so organizing in my school, but then also trying to organize within the West Side and the cops at CPS, I would say put me like in a different situation than maybe the other youth that were involved mm -hmm. um, within cops out of CPS. Um, so yeah, that was that was pretty interesting, especially mm -hmm. like being someone who had already worked on no cop 
and like the pushback is like oh so y'all don't want a police training academy and then y'all also don't want <laughs> y'all don't want them in y'all schools yep. so, yep. yeah yeah so, that's very interesting were you like were there meetings that were specific to like Whitney Young students that yeah. were trying to accomplish okay and yeah. then were there meetings that were like more coalition-esque that yeah. were across yeah. the city okay yes there were like there's like the coalition and then like the Whitney Young chapter and basically we were trying to get as many chapters as many like top side of TPS campaigns within the individual mm -hmm. schools because at the end of the day it was like a local school council issue um mm -hmm. and so like we organized so each local each like school had its own little vote about like whether or not it was going to keep yeah. like the pops in the school or whatever and so our focus was to try and like get so the local school council really doesn't have any student representation it just has one student representative yeah and so our focus is to try and was basically like you know figure out who's on the local school council and try and get them on our side to vote against and i think like we, we had like i don't remember how many members we had we, this it was less than 10 but we were able to get like three or four votes on our mm -hmm. side against like having the um the sros in our schools um and despite the fact that we lost it was still a big deal that we were able to get anybody on our side because like i said this the local school council doesn't have any student representation and so yeah. it's very very hard to like i would say it's even harder to like move those people to your side and like maybe like city council you know what i mean because yeah. there's no representation um besides like the one student representative and the student representative doesn't get a vote so it's very yeah. interesting yeah i i talked to other students who had lsc votes that were taking place especially in the north side and specifically in selective enrollment schools that were in the north side and how that experience was probably very different from your own um and so i'm curious like if you could t talk a bit more about like what what kind of resistance you faced um that led to the the vote at Whitney Young and then were you able to move that target you mentioned from the board of ed when it comes to Austin yeah so um the resistance was mostly like it was more more so about power like this idea on like if you know local school council should be able to decide like if we kept SROs in schools or not, or if it should be, you know, individual schools, or if it should be up to the mayor, because despite the fact that local school councils have the vote, at the end of the day, the mayor could override all of that and say, yeah. hey, no SROs, period, like, despite what the, what the local school council uh, did. And so, like, like, sort of like Lori Lightfoot was like a target in and of herself, because it was like, she was pushing the responsibility off to the student, the uh, LFC, so that she didn't have to make the decision. And so when we talked, she'd be like, no, it should be up to the local school council. It should be up to the local school council so that she didn't have to be, quote unquote, I guess the bad guy, but really like work in our favor, um, which was like sort of like what we were organizing against. Because again, it's like student resources officers are in the schools that impact students, and students don't have any representation of the local school council. Mm -hmm. um, and so, that was a hard thing. And also another thing being like, you know, local school council being like, oh, you know, well, well, we we aren't the ones that allocate the funding to CPD. So we don't, we shouldn't be your target. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, y'all are not the only target. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the city yeah. as well. Um, and they're like, you know, the, a lot of people, the lot of times they'd be like, you know, well, we aren't hiring the SROs. You know what I mean? We aren't the ones that that have them in the school and it's like well, well you guys have the power to not have them here you aren't the ones putting them here but you have the power to not have them there mm -hmm. um and then in regards so like there were like uh for this campaign i would say there was even more of a, like a multi-layer of like targets so like there's like the school the local school council the board of education and then the mayor Mm -hmm. um and so like despite the fact that we were uh organizing like on a local school council level we were also organizing on a board of education level because they have even more they have the like basically the final vote like the local school council has a vote for the individual schools but the board of education has you know the vote and so like i said we were targeting you know board of education members and i actually had uh, a meeting or oh, i i had a phone call like a zoom call like this like about two hours 
um, with other Black youth, with the Board of Education member, Doreen Trust, and it did not go well. Like, he was not trying to hear us out. He was saying, like, oh, you know, he he's basically the same stuff that I was telling you earlier about, like, trying to make us the bad guys, being like, you know, oh, well, you know, these kids come to these schools, and you don't know if they got guns on them, and we need police officers, and this and that, um, mm -hmm. you know, these kids come from troubled neighborhoods, and he loved using this troubled, 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 troubled word, and all this other stuff, and for us, and he was saying, like, you know, I, I had a cousin, uh, I had two cousins, and an uncle that died from gun violence, and all this stuff, and it's like, okay, and we have two, like, that, like, those are not mutually exclusive things, and it's sort of the same narrative, you know, like, oh, you know, I'm older, you know, I've, I've lived in the city longer, so I, I know what I'm talking about, and it didn't go well. We tried to have a conversation with him. He was cutting us off. It, it did not go well at all, and so mm -hmm. when we start, I, uh, later on down the road, I other stuff, I organized a cot out of CPS um, rally march to his house specifically mm -hmm. to target him. Mm -hmm. And he ended up coming outside. Well, we had like a black party, so it was a black party. He ended up coming outside and he called the police on us. <laughs> yes, he called the police on us. And I'm like, well, you know, we're trying to have a conversation. You didn't want to have a conversation with us like behind closed doors. We're trying to talk to you, you know, like we, 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 we are CPS students and alum, like this impacts us. And he was just, again, just not trying to hear us out. And he ended up voting against us. Um, mm -hmm. we, didn't, we weren't able to move him to our side, but it was interesting, like, like just all of my organizing, like being able to like talk to all these different types of people, like board of education members, aldermen, LSU members, like titles that, that I didn't even know existed. You know what I mean? Being able to like have conversations with them despite the fact that they did not all go well, it was still interesting because like, it was like, wow, we have all this power that like, we didn't even know that we had. And like, mm -hmm. when it comes to like making decisions, like having SROs in your school or not, so. Yeah, yeah, that's very important. And I guess like before we kind of come to our final question, um, I'm curious if you could talk a bit about how you think all of this organizing impacted your relationship with policing structures although that has been a theme that we we're like talking about throughout, um, it still doesn't mean that you're like, you know, you're living in, in an over-policed community and still coming into these interactions throughout. And I'm curious, like how it changed the way you, you think about those experiences or how you feel. Um, that's a good question. I feel like um, the, the one thing that's different is that like I go to HBCU now. Mm. So Excuse me, I always say that like it's interesting because it's like so it's all black, but like DC is still like one of the most like heavily over police, the most heavily over police place like in the nation. And like mm -hmm. what it looks like to have like police officers like even on campus. It's interesting like being around like just other black black youth and like to hear their thoughts about like um, you know, having police officers on campus and stuff like that. It's because like the people who I'm getting pushed back from like has shifted. So like, it's no longer like city council or like student board, I'm not student board, um, you know what I mean? Board of education members, but it's like other black students mm -hmm. or like black administration. Like, so that's interesting. Um, I don't know if my relationship has necessarily changed, um, but it has definitely broadened my scope of like, it's not even like just about policing right like, now, like a lot of the organizing that I'm doing has a lot to do with like the military and militarization. And like, mm -hmm. especially like being in DC, I feel like I have a unique perspective and insight on, into that, it being the capital and like, not only like the local police department, but, like all of the private police departments and like the federal agencies mm -hmm. that like are within DC. I mm -hmm. feel like it has like broadened my scope that like, I wouldn't like, yeah, like I would have seen it because like this it's the same in Chicago, but like it's very it's much more blatant and in your face here. And I feel like living here has given me like that unique perspective. Like for example, like just driving around and like seeing like Boeing or Raytheon headquarters, um, mm -hmm. because we're by the Capitol and stuff like that. So or like having the National Guard be sent out and things mm -hmm. like that. So I don't know that like it's changed my relationship, but like it's definitely like expanded it like 
because like I at the end of the day abolition is not just about like not having police you know? yeah yeah so, yeah thank you for that answer and I guess that's my final question um I'm curious one when you look back during your high school years and even during the pandemic when you were still organizing as a CPS alum like what are you most proud of um and then I'm also curious to hear what you want to share with current and future Chicago like black and brown youth who are continuing these campaigns that you and other no cop academy organizers have like built yeah so I would say <laughs> I don't know if I had a direct impact on this but I would say one of the things that I'm most proud of is that Lori Lightfoot did not get reelected <laughs> from that year <laughs> I feel I feel like black youth has something to do with that yeah. I, I, the fact that Brandon Johnson is in the runoff mm -hmm. for mayor, that was definitely like CPU and Black U. But yeah. that's like a side thing. Um, <laughs> what am I most proud of? I would say I'm most proud of like the ways in which like no cop has informed like current movements like nationally today. Because sometimes like I hear people like talk about no cop and I'm like damn you know what no cop is like I I don't even, I don't think like I fully grasp like the impact that it has had like on like other movements and other people because it felt like I feel like being in it and organizing it I felt like nobody was paying attention but that's because the people within the city like my time they, they didn't care but yeah. that doesn't mean that like people other otherwise other in other places um yeah. weren't paying attention and so like for example, to hear like that, like No Cop City, like the Black organizers from No Cop City, like they were inspired by No Cop Academy, and then to see how big No Cop City is today, like that's mind blowing to me. And yeah. just I'm just most proud of like us being able to like change the narrative and like sort of like set the ground for like future work because mm -hmm. I like I'm thinking like like you know what defund had what that have happened is like no cop didn't happen you know what I mean and yeah probably would have but like would it have looked like what it looked like you know what I mean yeah. um, so I would say that's what I'm most proud of um because like when you're in the situation like working against your target like they can do a lot to make you feel powerless but I feel like you have to step outside of the moment and like like now I can see like, wow, like we really had a big impact that I didn't even realize that we were having at the moment because Lori Lightfoot was telling us we was ridiculous. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and what would I say to like future black and brown youth in the city? Um, I would say to not get discouraged. Um, it's easy to feel like you're the only one that like cares or like mm -hmm. that's passionate about the issue, but like that is not true. Like there's so many people that are like passionate about what we're passionate about it's mm -hmm. just hard to find them be sometimes because that's how the system is set up like it doesn't want us to like unify and like band together to see to come together and m have a revolution you know what i mean yeah. so that's just the system working as it's supposed to like there's always people that are passionate you just gotta find your people and rock with them and uh, i think that's it for and to tell young people that they have more power than they think they do, like mm -hmm. them thinking they don't have power again, it's that's that's what that's what the system wants us to believe. Because if we think mm -hmm. we don't have power, we'll never do nothing to overthrow anything. But if we know that we do have the power, then we can band together to maximize it as much as possible. And uh, I think that's it. Period. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sharing all of those experiences and those lessons and for taking the time to meet with me. No problem. Sorry it took like two months. Huh? I said, I'm sorry it took like two whole months. No, you're so good. Wait, I also just forgot that I have to ask the quick demographic questions. Can I just quickly go through those? Yeah, of course. Um, and also feel free to not answer any of these questions if you don't want to. Um, to be honest, I don't really fully understand why I need them. <laughs> um, so what um, racial and or ethnic identities would you identify with? Black and African-American. Um, and then what is your gender identity? Um, <laughs> how do I answer that? You, you also don't have to answer it. Um, and then where um, were you eligible for free and reduced lunch while growing up? Yes. Um, and then what level of education did your parents complete? Like 
my mom is like high school my dad is like some college okay um and then what kinds of responsibilities did you have after school <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't mean to laugh. <laughs> like just like generally I think okay um babysitting is that a good one yeah yeah um I'm gonna quickly end the recording